thank you everyone for attending. Uh, this is obviously our first annual Chronic Cup. We named it that because we couldn't run ads on Facebook, Instagram. You might have discovered we could run ads on LinkedIn. Um, Ted's going to kick us off today uh, with a short speech about why we're all here, um, how Flower Company got here, uh, the story of Flower Company, and then we're going to go straight into pitches. We have six amazing companies today and a panel of awesome judges that I'm about to uh, present after Ted's short introduction. Um, so without further ado, Ted Lichtenberger, CEO of Flower Company. Thanks, Tony. So uh, I'm the co-founder CEO of Flower Company. We are the Costco of cannabis. Folks pay about 100 bucks to get weed delivered to their door at half the price. Uh, and uh, we're coming to change the retail market. Do you want to click the next one? So I'm going to tell a little story about how I went from uh, taking farmers uh, and bringing them into the regulated market to taking on uh, black market shops uh, head on, taking on the black market head on. So Flower Co. saves you half off. You can skip through this, Tony. Uh, this is where we're active, up in the Bay Area as well as down in LA. And we just are about to launch in the next 30 days in-store pickup where in LA, you'll be able to pick up in the West Side and in Hollywood from dispensaries, which is going to, you know, be like the Amazon locker of cannabis, which is pretty cool. Um, but I got started helping farmers up in Humboldt, and I was uh, excited as I left McKinsey to help these people who had been building, uh, you know, being the weed basket for America, bringing product uh, to the rest of the country. Uh, and they needed help coming into this industry. Um, we were starting to see in 2016 regulation on the horizon for uh, at least the medical side, and then in November, Prop 64, which totally transformed things. And um, you can go to the next one. So, you know, the, the beauty when I first went up to Humboldt captured me. And folks went up there not to uh, create a commercial cannabis industry, though it became the most important place for the development of that. Uh, they actually went up there to build a community, and they used the plant to power that. Um, but uh, it's, it's one of the most beautiful places in the world, and uh, despite myself having to drive all over the state, uh, over 100,000 miles my first couple of years, this uh, scene uh, kept me sane. And what we did, well, yeah. <laughs> All right, I'll, I can talk loudly. So what we did is uh, we, we talked about the story and we talked about the farmer. So back in 2016, all the dispensaries wanted were bags of pounds of flour. They didn't really care who the farmer was. And while I would go into you know, a sight glass or into a brewery and see the maker and hear their story, uh, on, the si on the cannabis side of things, that was um, not the way things were. So we um, instead focused on uh, producing pre-rolls. This was a product category that you could actually talk about the farmer. You could talk about who had um, built it and what their mentality was and talk you know, about how uh, different um, terroir uh, from having cultivation sites at 300 feet versus uh, 4,000 feet um, in the same county could impact the flavor profile. And that was really exciting to be part of. Um, and so to, to really, uh, to, to, um, to power the whole thing, um, I ended up uh, selling, um, bootstrapping the business, selling trim uh, and other biomass to dispensaries and uh, brands and, and retailers around the state. Uh, and at the same time, built up a uh, following of the Humboldt Legends brand of these pre-rolls. Um, and we, you know, I, I did this, as I said, kind of going all over the place. I drove over 100,000 miles my first few years, and I think everybody in this industry can um, uh, you know, know the hardship we go through as we build businesses, as we have to deal with a lot of additional regulatory compliance. Um, and because it's such a relationship-heavy space, uh, it was really important to be in person for a lot of those meetings as we were just getting started. Um, and so, you know, this is a, a picture of me on top of a big pile of trim. Um, you know, all those distillate carts come from these, uh, these bags of trim. Uh, but 
what I was able to do through that activity, through going you know, from San Diego to Humboldt sometimes in the same week a couple times, was to build, relation, build relationships around more than just the brand or the one product that I was trying to build at the time. And so as these um, uh, different companies come up to pitch tonight, I think we should all remember that uh, you know, this industry is built on trust and um, when you're going in and trying to solve a problem that you think your product solves, it's important to be open-minded and just learn what the other, their problems are because you might stumble upon other opportunities or find ways to make that relationship tighter, uh, which is so important in this sort of maturing, emerging market. Um, but I got frustrated. Uh, retail sales in this industry suck. Uh, working with dispensaries, I got frustrated because they wouldn't, uh, they'd, they'd, they'd ask for as much time as possible to pay me and then I'd show up to get paid and they wouldn't have the money and when they wanted product, they wanted it like that, but uh, they didn't actually know what they wanted necessarily. And so we kept experimenting and looking for new ways to uh, tackle this problem and help those farmers that were motivating uh, me and the rest of the team uh, get product to market. And so. Um, you know, what we realized was that while everyone was so excited coming into 2018 last year, and I remember December of last year, the demand was through the roof, the biggest month um, I had had. And as taxes and regulation went into effect, it slowed down growth. And the same uh, friends of mine who I'd seen as I uh, went all around the state canvassing dispensaries um, and trying to sell into those dispensaries, those same friends I realized were stopping buying from stores. They were starting to buy from the black market. And that didn't really make too much sense to me. So, um, you know, we, we still wanted to help our farmers. These are the people that motivate me every day to. Uh, continue to build these companies. Um, so I wanted to help them. So instead of giving up on uh, this business and the frustrating side of retail in the industry, um, we uh, figured out that a wholesale cannabis membership club, just like Costco, could help remove some of the distance between the farmer and the customer, and in many ways, um, bring about that goal that I had of, of helping farmers connect with, um, with consumers and for consumers to understand the farmer's story. And um, what was uh, crazy is because of our model, we were actually able to beat the black market on price. So I went around to a bunch of, of the illegal shops down in LA a couple weeks ago, and their flour costs about 20 bucks for the cheapest stuff. You can get really crappy shape, shake for less than that, but about 20 bucks an eighth. And flour company sells eighths for nine bucks. And after tax, that's 15. And that, that product, you know, doesn't have a bunch of mycobutanol, which turns into cyanide when you burn it, or cadmium and other heavy metals that the new testing is showing up in a lot of uh, product around the state. And so, um, you know, this is a problem down in LA. There's a lot of these shops, they're making it really hard for people in the regulated industry from the dispensary side to um, exist. And that challenge is me uh, means that the farmers upstream that uh, I feel like we work for are also having a hard time because they're being left with the option of diverting product to the black market or um, trying to push product through a system that already has too much. Um, and so, you know, we've been pretty excited with the response so far. This is a map of um, some of our orders recently, and um, uh, we are really excited to uh, bring a flower company around the rest of the state over the next couple of months and continue to uh, innovate on the way that uh, e-commerce and cannabis are coming together. So I'm really excited to see what else uh, folks are building tonight and see how we can use this same supply chain and uh, channel to help take their businesses to market or help them accelerate what they're working on. So thank you for your time and uh, thanks for everybody for coming out. Awesome. So, whoo, got louder. Uh, I'd like to take a minute to introduce some of our judges. Um, we've brought in people who even flew in from Los Angeles, uh, drove from Santa Cruz, flew from Hawaii. So 
We have some awesome judges here with us tonight. Uh, so first off, Libby Cooper. She is the ex-creative director at Ease and most recently launched her own brand. Uh, I believe Flower Company was the first store to sell her brand. It's called Space Coyote. It is a uh, an extract-based uh, joint. It is my personal favorite pre-roll. Didn't hear that from our other vendors. Um, <laughs> cool. Thank you, Libby, for coming all this way. Ted is our second judge. Uh, I'll spare him the introduction. Um, Kevin here. Uh, Kevin is a partner at Y Combinator. We actually just graduated from the program about a week and a half ago. Uh, they have an event called Demo Day. In fact, one of the other companies here tonight is a fellow YC company. Um, Kevin, prior to working at Y Combinator, sold Wufu to SurveyMonkey. So thank you, Kevin, for coming. <laughs> Elise here tonight. Um, she drove all the way from Santa Cruz, my close to my hometown. Thanks for coming. Uh, Elise has a long history as a writer in the industry, focusing mostly on recipes, uh, desserts. Um, you've worked on a number of videos, productions. It sounds like uh, you've been ar around the block probably more than most of us combined. So thank you. <laughs> and then Jonathan here flew in from Los Angeles this morning. Uh, he is the editor-in-chief of Green Entrepreneur Magazine, uh, the magazine that ranks uh, we dinky little startups, hoping uh, someday we'll be featured in his magazine. Uh, but thank you very much, Jonathan, for attending. So for, first off, we have Burbix. So my name's Steve. Um, I'm one of the co-founders at Burbix. Burbix makes it easy to collect and instantly verify photo IDs. My co-founder Eric and I each spent five years building out the trust and safety team at Airbnb. We got to see firsthand just how broken the identity and fraud space was, and things haven't changed much since we first started looking back in 2012. So we've set out to build the very product we wish we could have used well at Airbnb. We have a delightful way for users to scan a photo ID online. This works on any sort of device, be it a laptop, a desktop, a smartphone. There's no apps to download, and it all takes place in the browser. We grab a photo of the front of the ID and scan the barcode on the back. We automatically extract all the information from the front of the ID as well as decode the barcode on the back. Now, this is instantly available to our customers, including direct-to-consumer cannabis platforms. No longer is there a need to have users or worse yet, staff transcribe ID numbers, expiry dates, and dates of birth. Finally, we validate both the image as well as the data we extracted from it, run a bunch of checks against that, and return back to our customers any problems we find with a particular ID. And it's ultimately customers that can configure what to accept and what to reject. Here's a great example of we have a 41-year-old, but it's an expired ID as well as a known sample. And all of this is pulled out automatically and instantly. Now, you might be kind of wondering, why do you really care? Why, why should the cannabis industry care about this? Well. First and foremost, in California, there is ID-based age checks required for direct-to-consumer purchases for retailer licenses. Now, what's interesting here is, while we were at Airbnb, we tried so many different things to figure out how to mitigate risk, both online and offline in the real world. And year after year, the most effective tool we had to mitigate fraud was actually an ID check. Now, the cannabis industry actually has a huge advantage here. Why? You have a regulatory requirement to collect IDs from every single consumer in a retail transaction. That gives you a huge advantage that most industries don't have. Now, I know many of you might think that's burdensome, and you know, taking a photo of my ID and saving a file and manually uploading it somewhere is a huge pain. And that's why we've made that so much easier. Now, the reason this should be important to you is because it helps you fight fraud. First and foremost, you can detect duplicate IDs. Know when the same ID is being used again on a different account. Second, you can reject fakes. 
even fakes that your delivery drivers would literally not be able to tell apart. Third, and most importantly, block bad actors. While we were at Airbnb, we saw some fairly prolific incidents, both online and off. You've probably read about some of them in the media over the last few years. It's been saddening to me to hear some of the theft and fraud issues on delivery attempts. We're already working with a number of cannabis platforms today to make their delivery safer. Why? Because if there's an ID check placed at order time, you can verify the same ID at delivery time and not dispatch a driver to an address before an ID is even collected. So today we're already helping a number of cannabis um, providers instantly verify IDs. We actually store that data securely in our own system. We just finished a security certificate certification called SOC2, and you actually own this data. We don't. Our customers define the retention policy. We don't. Already talked about safer deliveries, and most importantly, we actually help cannabis platforms stay compliant, both with the ID-based checks and fraud reports. But what we really want to talk about is what we want to do next. First and foremost, we want to offer a vaulting service, and we want to partner with the cannabis industry to know what is the bare minimum information you need to keep on file or we need to keep on file on your behalf to stay regulatory compliant, keep the wreckage you need, but not put at risk the industry and all of the customers whose personal information is currently being collected and stored in a bunch of different places, potentially with different security standards. Number two, blacklists. Talked about this a little bit in the fraudulent use case of delivery drivers. There's another use case too. Some retailers out there that are getting pretty creative and still accepting credit cards for online transactions. Those have really high chargeback risk. Yet another piece of fraud that you're able to mitigate against if you can add that ID to a blacklist. But most importantly, the one thing we want to try is we want to build the conduit through which cannabis platforms can share fraud data with one another. If someone's going to rob one delivery driver from one company, they're going to rob them all. We want to step in and offer a means by which all of you can be empowered to safely and securely share the fraud that's occurring within the industry before it gets too big and out of control. Thank you very much. Questions, I do believe. Yeah, just pass the mic. Judges only. Are you both uh, technical? What are your skill sets? <laughs> um, we are both technical, um, but my co-founder is the CTO, I'm the CEO, and Eric's doing, has done 90% of the technical work, as well as a couple of the software engineers that we've hired. How much do you charge? Great question. We start off at a dollar a scan. At scale, we can come down to cents on that dollar. Um, uh, how are the dispensaries actually using this API? Are they programming against it? Great question. So right now, this is an online-based system. So we actually render an iframe on your website. So if, if part of the delivery flow would be either at account creation, at payment collection, or at the moment the order is placed. We would actually collect an ID at that point in time and do the instant verification. Then you dis uh, the cannabis platform would decide whether or not that ID is acceptable to actually dispatch a driver, and they would have already received the crop photo of the face off the ID, the name and the date of birth, to show to the delivery driver to confirm that is in fact the individual and that ID exists at delivery time. Uh, tell me a little bit about what you did at Airbnb previously that informs this job and makes you the right candidates to create this company. Great question. So when I started at Airbnb um, circa 2012, I started with, I was one of the first PMs of the company. There was one engineer and a half a data scientist and a signed contract with Jumio, which is one of the more prolific identity verification providers out there. And we had to literally guess and test 
how to mitigate offline risk. The PayPal's, the Google's, the Amazon's, they had written the playbook on how to mitigate online risk. Spammy messages, fake items online, account takeovers. There were known ways to get ahead of that. The offline risk, no one had really mitigated that before. Property damage, property theft, fires, prostitution, suicides, other personal safety issues. These were issues that would occur at a fairly infrequent rate, but still enough that was problematic to the company, to PR, and to regulators. So it was our job to build a team to proactively detect and deter bad actors before these incidents even happened. And that's what we're building now. We want to actually partner with the cannabis industry, not only to provide the services we described here today, but to better understand the fraud vectors you're experiencing today and the fraud vectors you'll likely experience as the industry and any constituent parts of it continue to grow. Uh, what's your estimate as far as projections? Like, what's the market demand for this kind of service? Great question. So, in general, the current size of the identity verification market is approximately a $10 billion opportunity. That's projected to double over the next five years to approximately $20 billion. What's interesting here is I actually think that's a lowball estimate because it kind of goes after the traditional KYC or know your customer identity verification of opening up bank accounts. No one's gonna pay $3.50, wait five minutes for a verification to come back, a la Jumio. Instead, we're coming in and actually opening up a lower end of the market with a fully automated solution at a cheaper rate, so we believe we can actually help grow the size of this market. Will, it, will this work for medical cards? Great question. We currently do not support medical cards, but that is one thing that, once again, we would love to partner with the industry where we need enough data points and a granular understanding of the various formats those cards take and how what information we could in fact extract from them. It's something we're more than willing to play ball with. Awesome, thank you. Thank you so much for having us. My name is Mark Unger. I'm one of the co-founders of Alphabis. What we're building is a platform for incentivizing data sharing within the indoor agriculture industry to start answering some of the big questions around optimization. Now, we know the value of ag data is becoming more important. Um, it can help answer questions that are critical to the cannabis industry specifically, like what nutrient blend should I be providing my northern lights to get the best yield? what's the optimal lighting schedule for green crack, but this also goes with other things in agriculture as well, like lettuces and greens and all sorts of different produce. But collecting ag data is extremely difficult. There are a lot of companies that are keeping the in information to themselves but most of the companies are just too busy focusing on ramping up production and getting to a point managing their daily tasks that they can start to think about some of these things. So, like I just stated, the problem, managing grow schedules and daily tasks of facilities is actually really difficult and cumbersome, and it's costly when you make mistakes. If something doesn't get done or a task is missed, that can result in tables being left open for days or weeks, which is a huge loss for these companies that are paying so much to light these facilities and get all of the nutrients running and everything. So it's a huge risk that needs to be focused on now. And they don't even have the time to do some of the learning and optimization that can get them to the next point of increasing production, which is where we're trying to come in. So the immediate hands-on solution is to create a web-based platform that handles all of this task management and scheduling so that we can get to our future goal, which is to create this platform for data sharing. If we can help companies now, by creating a platform that allows them to view their grow plans, is completely responsive, includes all of their tasks so that changes to the system are updated automatically, then they can start collecting that data uh, to help answer some of these bigger questions in the future. And so our goal is not to stop at data and at task management and scheduling. Our goal is to be a huge data analytics engine that's answering the biggest questions around indoor agriculture. So who are we? Oh, I like this. Uh, 
This is our team. We're all recent UC Berkeley grads, and we're all here, so you can ask, ask us as many questions as you like. Kevin is our head of engineering. He's our go-to for anything technical. Uh, he's responsible for running all of the wonderful backend that currently powers our product and fixing everything in the future. He's an experienced software engineer, and he is also an iOS developer. Isaac uh, works as an engineer as well, but spends a lot more time focusing on product, uh, business strategy, uh, customer acquisition, and user research, and also ties in together between me and Kevin. I also work on product and customer acquisition, but my experience is in design. It puts me at the head of design and kind of marketing for us, getting the voice out there, and also just working with users and asking all the questions that have led us to the solutions we've gotten to so far. Speaking of marketing, let's talk about the market. So I put this number up here, this 5.6 billion data analytics is specifically one estimate for the indoor agriculture, the value of data in indoor agriculture in both reducing mistakes that are made so far with lack of knowledge, but also increasing uh, productivity. But we, to be honest, we see it more as a huge market that's really young and opening up and data is gonna play a big role in how decisions are made for, for the everyday tasks, like nutrient blends, like lighting, and even the development of future facilities. So it's big, we're excited. Um, oh, that's inconvenient, but our go-to-market strategy, uh, one of the tools we're really excited to use is to use these farm-to-farm -farm supply agreements. A ton of the cannabis producers basically use these to partner with other uh, cannabis producers to offer dispensaries or offer local markets a wider variety of product. But in order to do this, it means they have to have an accurate estimate of how much product they're going to have four months down the line, six months down the line. Luckily. Our grow plan has done that and can help easily manage those projections and yields and all sorts of good stuff, which means we can ship out reports like they do now, but on our platform, which gives us a great exposure to companies that aren't using us just yet. Along with that, we're gonna continue the tactics we've been using so far, which is like rental car and driving down a half moon bay and going from one greenhouse to the other, our guerrilla tactics and meeting people at incredible events like this, um, and also just attending all of the conferences and such and making as many good connections in the industry as we can and using our current connections as well. Um, we, of course, do have competition in the space. Uh, here are just a few examples, AgriList, Granular, Tend. They're all doing scheduling and task management for agriculture, uh, but they're not doing anything more than that. They're stopping there, and that's not our goal. We want to be a data analytics company. Big ERP software is also moving into the space, but many of the cannabis farmers don't want to pay $100,000 a year for an all-inclusive package. We want to solve that core issue for them, and we want to solve it fast. Uh, traction and growth, we've been working for about two months. Uh, we've partnered with beta customers. We talk to them every week, many times. Our goal is to have 50 by June and to start collecting all that data so we can prototype our ML by September. Um, and what we need, we're growing, but we want to be growing faster. Access to the incredible Flower Co. network is going to be huge for us in getting customers and increasing runway and all that stuff. We're super excited. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah. <laughs> Questions. So, why you guys? What's your experience within the agriculture industry? And I mean, we all just graduated, <laughs> so not that much. Um, but so we've been obviously like relying on a lot of advisors and people that are experienced in the industry, and especially partnering with customers. Right? We're building product fast, just talking to customers and constantly iterating. Um, but a lot of our um, advising comes from my uncle, who is head of innovation at a few vertical indoor um, cannabis grow in Canada, and he's been helping us a lot throughout this, guiding us through these problems. Um, we also are working with um, a guy who used to be a head cultivator at Caliva, um, and he's, we show him the product and are working with him on it, and making sure we're solving problems that works for these, work for these like huge indoor grows too. Um, and not specifically just indoor grows too, we're doing a greenhouse and we mix lighting stuff, but mainly things that are like scheduling problems. So yeah, we're not experienced in the industry because we're so young, but we, we're relying on advisors and talking to customers to solve the problems. Thank you. A lot of greenhouse grows have automated software that you know controls the vents and the ventilation and all that kind of stuff. And the, you know, 
how, does this plug into those kind of existing systems? Right now, no. Um, that's Great. something that we'll not, we don't think is difficult to integrate in the future. Um, right now, we really want to get down to scheduling and task management. Um, that was something we realized was a problem very immediately, that um, basically in these multi harvest facilities, if you're moving, like it's really important to move something from one location to another, and it all has to be like on schedule, or you lose thousands of dollars. Um, so we saw that that is a key problem, and we're going to mess around with all the integrations and stuff later. Um, we want to make sure we build, we just started in January, so we want to make sure we build a really solid MVP for task management, scheduling, um, space, space allocation, and then we'll start exploring those integrations. Yeah. Are your current uh, customers Canvas companies? Uh, half. So we're working with hydroponics farmers that are doing lettuce and stuff, and then we're aquaponics, sorry. And then we're also working with cannabis farmers. Yeah. Mostly mixed lighting. How much do you charge your customers today, and how much do you plan to charge them in the future? In the future? So right now, we're not charging any. So our goal right, is to get to that point where we have so much data so you can answer these complicated questions. Um, and with that as a goal, our priority is to get as many customers as possible and also compete with other scheduling task management companies. We don't want to be scheduling and task management, right? We want to be this huge hub for sharing data between farms. Um, and so we're going to start charging for the ML models and the optimization models, and not for the scheduling task management. Because yeah, again, we're not, we don't want to be a scheduling task manager. Yeah, and that's part of the objective in undercutting these existing ones is provide that service for free, provide a really good service, and then build yeah. upon that. Yeah. So like, and then we can answer questions like, you know, if you share your data, right? Now you can, now you have access to a whole network of other growers, and you can say like, what's the average yield per facility of my size, size, or like, what nutrient mixes goes into your northern lights, or what are your growth stages, right? Um, and so that's our whole thing, is like incentivizing sharing data. But we just want to solve this. We're building <laughs> scheduling task management to like map your whole facility so we collect the right data. Will, will, will your machine learning algorithms assume that a Northern Lights in my facility is the same as a Northern Lights in Libby's as you compare performance? That's right. Yeah, you got, you got it. <laughs> Uh, it's interesting, we've even been having discussions about this tonight too, and when we're working with one of these companies up in Canada, they do genetic testing on Northern Lights where they'll start 16 different seeds and then pick one, right? So you already have like genetic variety in a single strain. The way we're gonna solve this in the, in the short term is using kind of the like uh, glass door model of I provide my salary and I get to see kind of the average of everyone in the industry. Um, that's gonna be the same with Northern Lights essentially, right? You're gonna see, okay, here's the yield of mine, let me see how it compares against this like mock-up. And of course there's gonna be outliers, but the bulk of the data should be somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Um, the classic Silicon Valley pitfall is offering a free service at the beginning and then saying, oh, we'll figure out how to make money in the future. Um, how are you going to deal with uh, cultivators who are already getting squeezed for their product? You know, as time goes on, flour is going down, the price of flour is going down. Um, how in the future are you going to turn around and say, and this is a service you now need to pay for? I think it's going to directly affect their, their revenue, right? So like the, the problem we're trying to solve is like how do you increase revenue or how do you increase yield? What's the best nutrient mix so you can increase productivity? Um, and like that, will, and because we'll have such a, a network of data, right, we should be able to answer those questions. So like our priority is gather the data and then you know, they'll pay for it because it will directly impact their revenue, right? Because they're gonna be using it to answer questions like, yeah, how, how can, like, if I wanna get a market in six months and I have these strains, like, what is my best growth plan? And like, how can I do that quickest to save the most money? And since we are building this to map all that data around the facility, scheduling and task management, the moving of stuff around the facility, we're mapping it in a way that is like, builds a great platform for collecting that data and then running the optimization algorithms on it. Cool. Last question. Sure. Who has the biggest burning hair problem of who you sell to or want to sell to? The ones that are in the most controlled environments. Yeah. Um, so like the ones that are like indoor, vertical, like aquapon not aquaponics, but hydroponics. Um, the ones that are like controlled environment. Like the one in Canada, we walked in, we had to wear like a whole hazmat suit and like take off our boots and throw them outside and stuff. Like the ones that are super controlled because one small delay costs them thousands of dollars. Um, for example, in Canada, they were talking about how uh, they like one of their plants took longer, one of their batches took longer to grow, so then they had empty space, right? And empty space means, you know, so much money. It was thousands of dollars they lost, and that's why they first thought that, like scheduling was a huge problem for them. Hence indoor, hence the focus there. Yeah, I'm first. Yeah. But any, yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you.
service for wholesome delivery based on Sacramento. One of the biggest problems that retailers, brands, and distributors face is customer acquisition and sales. That is, this is pure business. At the end of the day, you cannot make money if you don't acquire customers. And the current solution for acquiring customers in this business is read maps, paying them a bunch of money, or it's hopping on Instagram and pretending to be cool, or if you're a brand inside a club, you're doing demos and promotions, which cost money and do not always have a return. Actually, as a distributor for five years, I've seen where a lot of demos, a lot of investment have gone into retailers to help push product to sell, and it went nowhere. The retailer is not knowledgeable, they don't educate the staff for many, many other reasons. Brands really dependent on the budgeters and other people to drive sales within the stores. I recognize this and as a retailer myself, one that has a delivery license that allows me to do sales at events, I have discovered that there's a better way to acquire customers. Perfect. So I have a team um, that I built. I've been in the game five years, really focused on marketing, but my experience has all been events. While I've worked for other people, I've done every, every legal event in the last two years, from maybe high times to MO Cup, to Hemcon, and I've really understood the value of on-site consumption. Who here smokes weed? Perfect. <laughs> like, one of the things is like, how do you discover weed? Did you walk up to a store, glass thing, you couldn't smell it, couldn't taste it, no one could tell you about it, you're like, I want that? Or did someone just pass the joint to the left? Or pass it to the right? That's the Dutch. <laughs> Altogether Marketplace is my solution. The Altogether Marketplace solutions is our focus on creating sales and events that drives brands and acquire customers through sales. Imagine not spent, imagine recouping all your money in marketing in the same day by creating the right environment where people come to you, talk to you, engage with the brands, understand the product, buy, consume, and then buy again because they discover new things because of friends. This is the magic that is High Times, that is Hemcon, that is Emerald Cup. But the biggest problem is how you capture value. And that is something that we found is through, is through a few different ways. And it's always through customer engagement and it's through tenants of a great event. At the end of the day, our, our, our focus is creating powerful events for brands. I, because I have a non storefront delivery permit, I'm able to do sales for these brands where they could not do sales at these events. They need a retail permit for them to compliantly do sales. And we have found that a lot of brands come to these events and lose money. So they come to these events, they, they make a big presence, and they write off the marketing, and they sell $2,000 worth of product because it's priced wrong, or they don't have the right engagement, they don't have the right staff. We've taken in ourselves, in owning that and helping build the five tens. Brands are everything. But, so my concept at the end of the day, creating traction, is choosing the right brands, to be part of our booth setup, to be able to engage customers. You can have more than one flower brand. One of the big things that Ted talked about when he was talking about Humble Legend was Palmer introducing me products and buyers don't know what to pick. Instead, we work with the brands in curating the menu focused on what they're proud of. Customer service is everything. One thing that we found when we are building this model is sometimes because we get the right brands, we get the right variety of products, we have long lines. And so we make sure to create the right service and the right process flow to not only engage the customer, have them buy, have them be really excited, but then capture the information at the sales and process so then we continue engaging with them for the lifetime of the customer. Oh, okay, it's all good. Can some, yeah, no, let's go back. Perfect. Pricing and variety is everything. Usually when you see these events, you go and you pay $40 at MCON, $40 at high times, and you're walking in and now you're expecting cheaper product. But a lot of the times, they, they do the same 100% markup. So the buying for five is selling to you for 10. But we found if we sell to you for seven, if I do a 2% market before tax, a 20% market before taxes, I'm able to create velocity and if I can keep prices low, I can keep customers buying back and spending more money at our booths than they do it in any other, look, any other spot in the event. Variety is everything too. Not only do people like flour, but people like vape pens, people, people do tinctures, people use, use rubs, use basalts, a lot of different things when you walk into a club 
and no one can explain to you. The crazy awesome part about events is you can engage and you can show someone. You can have them smell the products. You can also have the peers consume and really share with you what they love. Um, the other thing about events is it's always displaying the right products and having the right menus to engage customers as they're running through for them to buy. Great. We're, we're up on time. Oh, can I close it? Yep. Um, go back to... In closing, at the end of the day, my goal is customer acquisition. I sit there and I can say, well, I've, created, I've done 75K to 100K at events before. And that's really by working with partners and producing the right setup and the right follow through. And really acquire customers, literally nothing. I work with brands, they pay for, they pay for the boost and then we ban. And then we help sell. The reason I think I can follow a flower company and really add a lot of value is because we can create the right consumption events that help people try the product, work with the brands that help really push the product, and then once we retain the customer, have them keep coming back through delivery. As a delivery service myself, I understand the power of pricing, but I also understand the power of education and people being familiar with the product. By engaging people on, on site consumption locations, we're able to do that and engage and create sales and gain a customer for life. Thank you for your time. My name is Matthew Gaspar. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Let's go. <laughs> How much do you charge brands and what do they get from that package? So I have three different solutions. I mean, I have two different solutions. One's a, one's a white label solution, where I'm just a sales solution for them, and I charge you from 5 to 10% margin. I mean, uh, just top. And then what I do with brands where we're fully engaging is I take a 20, and when we run the booth, we do it, I take a 20% markup. So instead of just a 10% markup, 100% markup of the normal retail plays, I get to between 10 and 20%. So I'm still able to add a lot of value, create a lot of sales, while at the same time adding a lot of value to, to the customers so they continue engaging. Sorry about that. I'm just trying to understand a little better the service ecosystem. So yeah. can, you, can you sort of give me an example like a you know of a customer? Like what a customer comes to you, what are what are you offering that? Like so a great example is like I ran a cup from a drone. But drone's a flower brand. What what I did for them is at the end of the day, they have a distribution license, but they don't have the bid to sell to you. And they want to acquire customers and gain more, and, and have people understand their brand, and they're not able to really do that inside stores because it's a small space. So they set up a booth, and they're actually engaged with people. People go up and buy their products. Right. But now they buy it at a cheaper rate, but I also get the email and the phone number, and I'm able to pass that back on to brands so they can engage with them to bring them back to either to my delivery so I can fulfill it, or to any other retailer that they're working with so they can continue driving sales. I found that a lot of brands um, have made money in the past with non-compliant events, but with compliance, it's, it's added a lot of costs, and it really takes a know-how to, uh, to run profitable consumption events. I get nervous about, is this a cons consulting for like events marketing, or is it sales or the service? So it's sales and service with consulting. Because I have a retail license, and because I, ha I have everything needed to do retail sales, I provide retail as a service. One thing I found just by doing retail as a service, that without the consulting, without the right menus, booths fail and lose the money because they don't understand how to maximize space and engage customers. So what percentage of your revenue comes from like, is recurring like when customers keep continuing to use your services? The moment I, well, what it is is I acquire a lot of customers through these events and then I deliver to them. I have statewide delivery. So if someone comes to LA, I, I mean, someone comes from LA to Sacramento or San Francisco, I'm gonna like, I can continue fulfilling that. My prices and my structure are a lot different than the flower company, so I'm not a direct competitor, because I focus on, on education and people understanding brands, and really kind of understanding through experience. But a great example is BetCB. When I engage some of BetCB in an event in October, I've kept them till now. Every, like, and BetCB is a CBD product for your pet. But I engage, and when I engage people at events, we're able to catch a customer for life as a flower service. Because, they have, because we give them a competitive price, we give them no incentive to go so uh, just to follow on to that question and your response, um, are they, uh, so the person who's ordering that CBD, yeah. are they ordering through your site or yes. are they ordering through the vet CBD site? So because we've done so many events with vet CBD, you actually go on vetcbd.com, you look at statewide, and you see our delivery services being the only one. Okay. At the same time, like because we require them the first time, we just follow through email to follow up with to acquire them. But with certain products, especially cannabis products, People are repeat buyers, and people can consistently get products they love 
and those get them into a liable, you gain a custom for life that really can't be shook for other reasons than that custom service. How many events are there like this in California in a year? So last year, um, was the first year, there was five, there was five events, four more were going, like this year, <laughs> this year there's already nine scheduled. And they're, they're planning and releasing more. There's, there's one happening, there's two happening on 420, one in Kushchuk and High Tanks in Sacramento. Kushchuk's in Atlanta. Um, they're doing Americana the next month. And they're just continuing building more events because more, more and more operators are understanding the value of Do you Does your business dramatically improve as more of these consumption events open up? Yes, but I, I really targeted this because I found this was the biggest customer acquisition I've ever had. I've spent money on VMAPs, I've spent money on Mantis, I've done, I've done everything from flyering and from shops, like having teams go out. And the biggest acquisition was I buy a booth, or I'd work with brands to, to build a booth, sell for them, make everybody money, but then I have a list of 1,500 customers that are paying to me their email, and like, we'd love to continue engaging. A lot of brands sleep on events because they've lost money. Because they, 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 they focus on footprint and they focus on being large, then, the, then they all have customer engagement. Mm -hmm. And so that's what that's one of the tenets of everything that they do. Awesome. Can I go, ask one more question? It. So, um, you know, I have a cannabis brand. I like space throwing, Coyote. yep, Space Coyote. I like throwing uh, small events mm -hmm. uh, with my team. Yes. Would you ever service a small Yes. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> so, this is the other thing I want to dive into. Event, the event model with compliance, if you understand compliance, and if you do sales in a certain way, you can actually do, uh, like, this Tupperware party concept that was huge a couple years ago in cannabis, with Viva and Octavia and a few others, you're actually able to do that compliantly now with the right system. If someone's having a private party and they place an order, and then they want to place a few other orders, I'm using the, my dynamic delivery model as intake take product, I can service them at the party in the sale as long as I do, as long as I follow certain rules. And it kind of opens up. I was I was the California uh, the Canada's Ready Expo a month ago, because my whole thing is I have created a model that I can work with bartenders and other people to supply products for weddings. I mean, we all consume alcohol at weddings, and like cannabis is consumed. Cannabis consumption is a game changer that regulators have been sleeping on because they don't understand it. But for sales, it, it really what changes something from being flat to going up. It's like hype products. Anything that's like hype, like Melanie from Alien Labs, it's because someone shared it with you. It was like. No, it's amazing. <laughs> and so like the social validation that exists at consumption events is extremely important. And that's something that I, that's a phenomenon that I type in, that it's happening to grow. Awesome, thank you very much. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Felicity and I'm the co-founder of Potly. Potly was founded a few years ago when I harvested my first batch of honey in my parents' backyard in Hayward. And then we infused it with cannabis and then with hemp-derived CBD. Um, but today, we're not gonna just talk about honey. Um, we're talking about Potly's ambition to be the world's first cannabis kitchen pantry. <laughs> Potly makes ingredients for the elevated life by elevating kitchen staples um, into modern healthy animals, we plan to um, capture and hold the growing mass market by infusing products into your daily wells team. Some key party trends we identified and observed, first off, um, legalization as well as um, recreational um, cannabis. Um, has brought in so many first-time cannabis users. There's also a, a trend in growing um, holistic plant medicine. Um, people are demanding a quality and transparency in the ingredients that are put into their products. Um, and uh, we talk about something called the aspirational lifestyle brand. And what we mean by that is uh, we see this in the beauty industry as well as um, fashion where brands build an entire lifestyle around what they um, what they do and um, it, it gets people to you know buy more of their products so 50% of our 
um, customers are all candy curious and we've heard so many amazing stories from our customers where they're like, I got my mom to try weed for the first time because she tried potly honey or I got my grandmother to try cannabis for the first time. And so we're so proud to have, you know, all of these users coming from these first, this first time um, base. We also, on the other side of the spectrum, service the cannoisseurs. And the cannoisseurs are the people that know everything about weed, basically everyone here, but they're trying to find new ways to incorporate edibles into their um, lifestyle. And finally, um, our wellness warriors. These are the people we call, you know, they're seeking the new new in terms of adaptogenics, um, as well as, um, you know, they're, they, they're, the willingness to pay is higher for them uh, because, you know, um, they're, 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 they're going after the health trends and all of that. So uh, where are we in making this vision happen? Um, in 2018, um, the, in the first quarter, we applied and got our temporary manufacturing permits. Um, we have our type N license in the Bayview. Our second quarter, we spent the entire time building our space out, making sure it's completely compli compliant. The third quarter, we, sell we started selling into the recreational market, and now we're in 36 dispensaries all over California. Thank you. Um, and in the fourth quarter, we got our distribution license. Um, at the same time, while we were doing all this, we launched our hemp brand. Um, we launched um, a direct-to-consumer e-commerce website, potleyshop.com. Um, as well as in the fourth quarter, we launched our olive oil, so a savory item to our sweet skew, um, our honey. Um, and today, I'm really proud to announce that we have launched our chili oils. Um, that's a recipe that has been passed down from three generations in my family. Um, thank you. Uh, as well as apple cider vinegar and chocolate are chocolate. We're, we're thinking about a Nutella. These are all brands that we plan to rapidly launch in 2019. Um, so in terms of where we are, um, we think that um, that in the growing and maturing cannabis space, um, that the confections and specifically edibles, um, they dominate the market, but um, that is going to flip and mirror our actual lifestyles. Um, and this creates an opportunity for healthy edibles. And the edibles that are going to be able to um, be used throughout your day, um, are going to become category leaders. And Potley is best positioned to capitalize on this opportunity by our expansive portfolio of Potley pantry items. And our competitive advantages are that we are a first mover in this space um, in terms of ingredients-based edibles. Um, we're creating this aspirational lifestyle brand around our product. Our product is versatile. And we have an, an amazing team and experience and know-how um, to make it happen. This is me and my co-founder. Um, um, I come from a background of sauces and spices manufacturing. My family has been in the business for over 40 years in food. Uh, my co-founder um, has a very strong background in retail strategy. Um, and we thank you so much for your time today. Uh, everybody, if you guys want to come up to me, I have honey sticks for you, as well as chili oils. Um, and I open to the floor for questions from our judges. Is, is Potley the first company to do cannabis-infused honey? And if not, what makes your honey so much better than the other ones? We are not the first to do cannabis-infused honey, although um, our, um, our honey, what makes it so special is we harvest it ourselves. We still do, do, do that today in the East Bay. So for everybody here, it's high local, uh, great for your allergies, and also, um, yeah, save the bees. <laughs> <laughs> what does it cost to launch an additional product line? So um, in terms of raw materials, that's really where, you know, where it, um, uh, the money comes from. And um, it, it really depends. Uh, 
Uh, but in terms of equipment, those have already been paid for, as well as having the manufacturing space to make it happen. Um, that's already been paid for. So it's really just raw materials and you know making that first batch and then proving that concept. Uh, how do you think about starting with hemp in places where you can't sell cannabis due to all the laws and regulations and compliance using the hemp versions of your product as a way to pull people in? It's been great. Um, the gray market is where you know we thrive in and we also have our e-commerce um, platform so you know it's accessible to everyone um, it's uh, but going after that is kind of our strategy in terms of going after states that don't have um, cannabis presence and really launching um, in stores um, there how are you engaging with your customers today um, and what do they think of the product yeah, we have a really strong um, community uh, through Instagram. Um, we have over uh, 6.8 thousand followers, um, and um, that's the best way to communicate with our customers. And we do amazing events um, like the La Family Cannabis, Cannabis Retreat, where we invite influencers. You know, um, uh, really show them and help them have a night of self-care and we um, then in that way just amazing organic um, marketing comes from that and people post about it and that's really how we engage with our community and get our word out there. For the other products that you're planning to launch yeah. down the line, like where will the raw ingredients come from? So, so like are you going to bring chili fields and have all the so, um, for example, our olive oil, we sourced from two brothers in Carmel Valley. They um, actually grew up on that orchard. And so in the way that we source our honey and, um, you know, we're, we're always looking for partners that, um, A, are from California, specifically Bay Area, and we want to, like, spread the word of, you know, um, where good ingredients come from. Um, but the chili oil, that's something that's a recipe that we, that has been passed down from generations. Um, that will be also local, um, as well as the um, apple cider vinegar. The, there will all be like barrier local um, ingredients that we will then try to evangelize and spread the word for. And then in terms of sourcing from the people like what are your margins um, if we uh, our margins uh, we it's a hundred percent markup so um, it's about a 30 30 to 35 percent um, and then if we you know continue to build and grow um, we'll be able to um, leverage a um, bulk discount when you um, are delivering across the country, do you think that the Bay Area narrative is going to stay relevant, or are you going to try and find hives in other states? Yeah, absolutely. So California grown, California um, and local California um, has been a big part of our story. However, we are starting to work in terms of like having an East Coast, um, work with different hives in the East Coast, finding like four different centers that have um, you know, have a lot of reach and um, matter and try to work with um, the honey locally that way. Um, so that is definitely a part of our plan um, to get people local ingredients. We got a question in the back. I have a question. Do you have a facility now that you produce everything in? Yeah, so we have. Is it able to scale with potential scalability? Absolutely. So we have a type N manufacturing license um, on our manufacturing space in the Bayview. Um, and then we have a separate manufacturing space in Union City where we produce our hemp. Um, and that is uh, connected to a $5,000 or 5,000 square feet facility. Um, and we're ready to scale um, at any point. Yeah. And so you've self distributed to date? Yeah. That's correct. And how are you uh, thinking of scaling your distribution as you continue to sell in more parts of the state? Are, are, you, are those 36 stores in Northern California? Are they spread everywhere? How do you deal with that complexity? 
Uh, th so our 36 stores are um, all over the state, mostly actually in Los Angeles. Um, and we have a distribution partner, Phoenix Logistics, that um, is amazing and that's really been helping us distribute um, in terms of um, getting into the right accounts that make sense for us because our price point is high and it's a high quality product and so um, people, it has to go into stores that can afford it. Um, and in terms of hemp distribution, we have all, we've been self-distributing, um, but we are talking to um, distribution partners for um, natural foods as well as um, hotel chains um, in the East Coast um, as well as in California. Do you have any hard data about people who buy the hemp version and then move over to the cannabis version? Is that a common trait or no? It's, I mean, we have our data from our e-commerce. That's what's amazing to have um, a direct-to-consumer channel, uh, but we do not have the data of um, who converts, uh, but that is the goal. The ultimate goal is that our um, hemp-derived CBD um, does marketing. Um, we do partnerships like with Matcha Bar. We're sold in Mr. Holmes' Big House, um, and eventually, you know, when people go onto our website, they can find that we also have the cannabis version, and you can get you high. <laughs> My name is Christine De La Rosa, and this is my cannabis origin story. I was a database architect for over 15 years, and when I was at the top of my career, I almost died from undiagnosed lupus. I spent many years being very sick, taking 11 pills a day, and doing a cannabis, I mean, doing an infusion, not a cannabis infusion, a regular infusion, <laughs> um, once a month. I've been three years in remission for lupus. Um, how did I do that in three years? I switched my entire regimen away from synthetic medications and opioids to only CBD and THC cannabis. Thank you. <laughs> Today, I get to stand in front of you thriving because I no longer take the medicines that were actually killing me. The original cannabis market actually was for underserved communities, especially here in California. And I'm actually one of those underserved communities. Um, I belong in that community. And one of the biggest problems I had when I was going to dispensaries in California was that they weren't serving me. There weren't people behind the counter that, could, that looked like me. They didn't have the information. They were very transactional. Get your cannabis and get out. And that was my experience for a lot of different places. And so we really wanted to start to target more community-based. So when my co-founder, one of my co-founders, Cheney, um, said, hey, let's start a dispensary, very naively we said, sure, why not? So we did. We opened up a dispensary. We welcomed everybody through our doors but we centered marginalized communities. And we didn't transact with them. We became partners in their health, wellness, and recreation. We built a company that was culturally competent and integrative with our customers and became part of their community. This is our special sauce. We built our company by rooting it in community, and not just Oakland community, San Francisco community, LA community, Fresno community. In the three years we've been open, we have built a membership base of over 4,000 people. Local communities have invited us to open stores in their cities. That's why we're going to San Francisco, that's why we're going to LA, that's why we're going to Fresno, and many other places. Last year, when we were ready to start raising money to purchase our licenses, this very same community raised $1.1 million for us. They are 66% women and women of color, 89% people of color. As we were being rooted in them, they were rooting for us. And that is so important because I can tell you, your best brand ambassador is going to be community because they are loyal to you. 
to understand where we are now um, is this graphic. Although we have a different customer base, our customers spend the same amount per transaction. We have a $1 marketing spend to a $10 marketing spend, and our customer retention rate is 84%. We have a sales per square foot that is above Tiffany's and Lululemon's, um, which is awesome. <laughs> Last year, as part of our raise, we went and purchased an existing dispensary in Portland, Oregon. So it's currently up and running. And we are fast moving in purchasing a dispensary here in San Francisco. We have seven social equity applicants in Los Angeles ready to, purchase, uh, ready to apply for their license for seven dispensaries. And we have dispensaries opening up in Fresno. And currently, we're in a lot of other markets getting ready for their adult use. So how do we go from getting one, wanting to get one license in Oakland to getting moving so fast to get licenses in other locations? Because we were invited to do so. The communities there saw our social equity model and um, said, we want to have one of you here. So we've been invited by Harlem, the Bronx, Rochester, Syracuse, Austin, Dallas, Minneapolis, um, and we're looking at all of those places to see where it's, we best fit in. Detroit, um, it's been a kind of an amazing experience. So what is our foundation? Well, we have financial inclusion. So we allow for micro investors to invest in their local dispensary. So they can invest in their Detroit dispensary, they can invest in their Harlem dispensary, they can invest in their Fresno dispensary. We have workforce development. We worked a lot with formerly incarcerated people, people of color, chronically ill, LGBTQ communities to make sure that they're prepared to enter the industry if they want to. And we have community reinvestment. We donate 10% of each of our net profits into a community reinvestment fund. We do not believe in beautification plans. We believe in actual um, money going into communities that are making millions of dollars for, for dispensaries. We do that in three ways. <clears throat> we can give you rapid response, fund, rapid response funds if you're a community organization. We can give you a grant if you're gonna have a small micro business or we can do an investment into you. And this, we really focus on people of color and formerly incarcerated so that we're investing in people that don't normally have access to capital. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> I think we can move to the next one. This is our team. This is not all of our team. These are not our employees in the Portland or the Oakland stores. This team is building a national and global brand. We believe in our mission, think global, lo think local, build global. We are driven by making profits because we want to make profits. We want our investors who believed in us to make profits and we also want our community to be able to benefit from this green rush. We do this by listening to our customers and evolving quickly to create better experiences for them. And we're working with municipalities and states to help them adopt a social equity form uh, foundation. Social equity will be a requirement to get a license in the future. And we know this because we're working with cities and states on their social equity platforms like Fresno, like New York State, like New Jersey, like LA. In the immediate future, you will not be able to get a cannabis, a cannabis license without social equity being part of the core of your company. Most can, cannabis companies right now are not ready. We are. We spent last year restructuring our company so that we would be fast and nimble into acquiring licenses and also opening stores across the country. We have first mover status in this area because we are, we've been working on this for the last three years. We are building a cannabis business for the 99%. Thank you. Yes? Uh, just to clarify, how many shops do you have open right now? 
we had two shops, one in Oakland and one in Portland, but we were a collective. And on January 9th, we could no longer operate as a collective. We had to op operate as a with a license. We had thought about that last year, so we have our dis dispensary delivery license. So we currently deliver to our 4,000 customers using that license with the promise that we're going to open one in Oakland when they release the applications. We're now moving into Fresno, Stanislaus County, and San Francisco with the hopes that we can go down to LA in advance of our brick and mortars so that we have brand recognition. Yes. What's the most repeatable process uh, or portion of your process in terms of onboarding new locations or municipalities or what is the most repeatable step in your process? The application with the social equity applicant. We did that in Oakland. We have seven in, in LA. We already have one here. We're going to have four others. How much do they differ from one market to another? You know, they're very similar. Most of them, our, our particular equity applicants are 33 and a third. A lot of other ones are doing 51%, but that doesn't fit our model for community reinvestment. How do you make money within your kind of parent or, or, or like HQ, per se? How does that make money? Um, and what is, what is its interactions with the stores? And the like? So we have a complex structure. We have TPD National, which sits on top and owns all of our assets, and it acts as a service management company. And then for cities that have more than one asset, they also have a holding company, and TPD National owns that holding company. And that holding company owns all of the assets, dispensaries, licenses, all of that. So we basically own all the way down, but in order to have some relief from the 280E, making the service management company sit at the top with the layer in between allows us to have better profit margins. Have you considered getting somebody to help you buy the real estate, the places where you go to work, and then making money off of that as well, like McDonald's? Yes, because we are not going to be in Beverly Hills. We're going to be in Boyle Heights. We're not going to be in Piedmont. We're going to be in Oakland. So we are being courted by many people who are running Opportunity Zone funds, because that's actually where our dispensaries are going to be. And how cool is it to go to your investors and say, hey, give us your money, and we have a person right here ready to lease this for 10 years. That same amount of time that you take out your money, you don't have to pay capital gains, you wait 10 years to take it out again, and you still don't have capital gains. So we are, in some ways, the best date. <laughs> Any other questions? Could you, could you go a little bit more into how you created, your team is obviously quite large. Yes. How, how did it all come together? Well, that's how we get into community. So that middle tier, if you want to go back, are the co-founders for that city. So LA has a co-founder, San Francisco has a co-founder, Fresno has a co-founder. And so what you can see is that we partner with people that are already in community. Our co-founders in San Francisco are the co-executive directors of the African American and Art and Culture Complex, spelled wrong, sorry. Um, Mike De La Rocha is the executive director of Raw Impact. They do specific work with incarcerated juveniles. Rawa is a Buffalo co-founder for New York. She does work. She actually buys um, properties and makes them into affordable housing. They have a $22 million portfolio, and they train all the people in the community to do the building of the houses. Cesar Casamayor and Gede Maza are Fresno co-founders. They're Fire and Height 911, and they work specifically with gang um, gang members and help them to get out of that life. And so these folks are invested in us, right? They want us to succeed because of our community reinvestment. And these are people that have 17 years in San Francisco, na um, LA native. Uh, Robo's been in Buffalo for 22 years. Sasad and Gadai are Fresno natives. And then down here, we have our C o CFO, our COO, our CSO, and then here we have Yvonne, our investor relations. So you have layers. This is our co-founder layer. Mm -hmm. Yes? How much does it cost to open each location or open a new dispensary? And then how long does it take to get up and going? We've gotten a dispensary up and going in 30 days because we've had to. This is one of the things about being a person of color that doesn't have access to a lot of capital. You become incredibly creative. <laughs> and it takes about $1.5 million dollars is what we're looking at for LA, but that's because the LA market is big, 
and expensive. We believe that once we get those first seven out of the way, we can reduce that footprint to about 750,000. In Oakland, it only took a quarter of a million dollars. We suspect that Buffalo, Rochester, and Syracuse, who have lower rents, right, and lower leases, would be able to be even cheaper than that. What is it about the scale that allows the cost to come down so much? We can buy in bulk, same as Flower Company. And maybe we buy from Flower Company. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thank cool. you very much. All right. Much. Thank you so much. All right. So that is all the pitches. The judges are going to enter in a room over there for a few minutes. Uh, feel free to make yourself at home, help yourself to some awesome food, and we'll be back soon. As a reminder, first place gets a $10,000 investment on behalf of Flower Company. So that's pretty exciting. Second place and third place get a lifetime membership to Flower Company, which I, honestly I think is worth more than 10 grand for the whole founding team. So without further ado, uh, very pleased. Matt, please come up of all together. Where are you, Matt? Congratulations, you get first place. Second place um, is, uh, well, second and third are, are tied. There's, there's no actual proper second place. Um, uh, Stacy with Entrick, please come up. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, um, if my memory serves me correct, um, the People's Dispensary. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm excited. It's kind of surreal, yeah. You have a lot of enthusiasm. Always, bro. I always realize it's your energy that you bring and people match you. And I think at events, we always have to keep this high energy. And so that's, that's really where I kind of get it from. We're just gonna continue to invest in our company. We're gonna continue just building and investing in infrastructure. I have one license. This is gonna help just keep moving the license forward. And eventually we're, we're going after more licenses. And I'll get gold everywhere, but this, I'll keep this. <laughs> this is dope actually.